Amen. Ooh, that was all God's people said. That was very uh, Baptisty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Woo. Cool. How you guys doing? You doing all right? Doing having a good morning? You okay? Cool. Great. Hey, you guys filled out some cards, which is cool. The prove it cards, which is yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Join in with Elizabeth. You guys, you guys proved it this week. Okay. All right. We're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. I wanna, I wanna read these to you guys if you don't mind. Um, oh man. Uh, okay. I forgot about handwriting too. That's something I have to try to do. Uh, I thanked veterans for their service. Let a vet go ahead of me in line. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, another one is uh, waived a $100 fee for a client going through a difficult time. Not a big deal for me, but brought them to tears. That is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Oh, this one's really good handwriting. I went to McDonald's, and rather than putting the change for a 20 in my pocket, I put it in the Ronald McDonald House charity container. Wow, cool. Uh, this one has, has a few of them. Enjoyed sharing and laughing with other ladies. I hope that was a lady that said that. <laughs> Made connections for a nonprofit I support, which is cool. Yeah. I don't know how much we should clap. We're, we're learning as we're going, so as much as we want to, okay? Just learning together. Uh, told some guy friends about beer and Jesus. Made their whole day by that, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, really good handwriting again. Took two hours to offer free brainstorming and business planning session with a friend in need. Now that's a, that's a chunk of change right there. Checked in with a struggling friend who felt like they had nobody who could understand and was isolating. Awesome. Wrote a cover letter for a friend applying for a great job. Signed up to mentor students at my college through an alumni program. Sweet. <laughs> this one says top Christian, so just, this is a top Christian. If anybody was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. All right. You get the prize. All right. Jesus is going to come down in a cloud and thank you personally. Um, no, probably not. Okay. Uh, I should not share such theology with, <laughs> like, somebody's going to write that down. Like, okay, top Christian gets personal visits from Jesus now. Um, like, manifested. Left a $20 tip. Uh, laugh at my husband's jokes. Okay. Yeah, that is... <laughs> That is the one. Uh, prayed for friends, uh, family, and coworkers. Made breakfast for my son. Words of encouragement. Top Christian. <laughs> um, this one says shoveled two people's driveways, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and then uh, one of my friends didn't didn't write this on a card, but they got they they got cut off in traffic. Um, on Monday, actually, and they were about to throw up, you know, the bird, and they, they instead just, you know, did like a weird rainbow, like, hey. <laughs> so that worked. I mean, that worked. I mean, they may have said something, but they didn't, I mean, progress is progress, right? Progress is progress. Uh, so those are our prove it cards. One of the ways that we as a church are going to be proving it is with small groups. We have uh, some groups that we want to get started. Um, and so if you're interested in a small group, we would love for you to uh, contact us. Let us know um, if A, you want to be a small group leader or B, you want to be involved in a small group. So these are really important times. Um, to be in a small group. They in, encourage one another. Uh, we've got guys groups, we've got women's groups, and now we're putting together some like couples, families, all of that kind of stuff too. So not to say that you have to be involved with everything, okay? Don't hear us be like, hey, we've got small groups, we've got men's groups and women's groups, and, and we've got serving opportunities, and we've got like all this kind of crazy stuff happening, and it's like, okay, this is getting to be a bit much. We're not expecting you to come to every single thing and every single event that we have going on, but we do 
want to make sure uh, that we provide a, a variety of things for people. And so um, those are small groups. They're a great way to connect with other people, with other believers, uh, to get to know people. Um, and, and we kind of like form groups naturally. Anyway, uh, it, was, it was interesting. I was talking to Russ this morning who owns this place and he was, um, there's you know security cameras and all that kind of stuff. And he was checking out the cameras right after service last week. And he said it was really interesting that immediately after, after service, everybody just kind of went to groups of like six. And it was just a very natural thing. People just were like, group, 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 group. And he said it was the most bizarre thing to see. Like you said, amen. And then it was like scatter and everybody was just together. And it was really cool. So groups are kind of a natural thing. And uh, we want to make sure that we continue to provide those types of things uh, for us. And small groups are also really important because as we're going through this study in Genesis, there's a whole bunch of details here that I don't get to get into. There, I, I mean, we don't have a ton of time every single Sunday. And so uh, whether your group wants to do like sermon-based and keep going through the scripture that we're going through, or you want to do a different small group, we've got one uh, with guys that we're going to be starting up that's going to be um, based on some, some books. Uh, that we're going to be going through. But with sermon-based stuff, it's, it's good because we're going through this entire book of Genesis. And there's, I, I'm telling you, there's a ton of details here that I just, I don't get to get into. Um, and those are really great things for small groups to get into, to, to, to try to figure out what this means and what that word means and, and dive a little bit deeper. And so that's kind of my plug for small groups. You have great community with one another and you get to learn a lot more. Um, and there's a lot of details in this chapter that we're going to be finding out that I'm just not going to be able to get into. But this is an important chapter, chapter three, in this series. Chapter three, this is where everything pivots. This changes the entire trajectory of the human race, chapter three. Because of chapter 3, we have the rest of the Bible, which is insane. Because of chapter 3, we have to have the rest of the Bible and a rescue plan in place. Because of chapter 3. See, chapter 2 was a lot of backstory, right? We talked about it a little bit last week. It was a lot of backstory. Here's creation. Here's all this kind of stuff. Chapter 3 is now pushing the story forward, pushing the narrative forward, and we're going to see how we got to where we are today. Chapter 3 has implications, not only for that time, but for the rest of humanity, for all time. And so, chapter 3, this is going to be the first chapter that we actually read every single verse. That's how important this chapter is. So, if you have a Bible, uh, or if you have a tablet, or any of those things that you would like to read along with. I read out of the ESV. Um, that's my choice. Some people choose the NLT, the NIV. Use whatever fits in your brain, okay? But I, I read from the ESV, and I love taking notes. And uh, we're going to kind of just go through this a little bit, hopefully a little bit at a time. Hopefully I don't stop after every verse and say something, because then we're never going to get out of here. Um, especially with, with as many verses as we have. But this is the start of the fall in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now, a lot of references. I know I just said I better not stop after every verse, but here we are, okay? I need to at least get this backstory out of the way, okay? The serpent... Uh, was, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. They're referring to Satan, okay? Moses is referring to Satan in this verse right here. And you can find backstory if you have notes, if you have something that you write with. If you want to find backstory on how this all transpired, how Satan got into the Garden of Eden in the first place, all of that kind of stuff, he's a fallen angel. You can read about it in Isaiah 14, Verses 12 through 14, if you want to write that down, be like, I need a little bit more backstory on, on who, who Satan is and how he got, it's a, it's a whole story, okay? So you can write that down, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. And Ezekiel 28, 12 through 18, if you want to write down some of that kind of stuff, 
write down that passage as well. You're going to find some backstory. They're actually talking about two kings in, this, uh, in, in both of these chapters, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. He talks about these, these two kings, and what's behind those two kings is this force of evil, Satan, and then it gives a little backstory on how he got to where he was. Backstory is important. One last one is Job 38, 4 through 7. You'll be able to read that as well. Now, hopefully, if a couple of weeks ago you read Job 38, 39, 40, 41, or was that right? Yeah, 42. 38 through 42. That was like, wow, that was a lot in my brain. Um, okay, so that's the background on Satan. He's in the garden, and he was there. Okay, there were fallen angels. He was one of them. He wanted to be like God. In fact, he wanted to be God. He wanted everyone else to worship him. And so God sent him out from heaven, and now here he is. So that's how he got here. All right, verse, still verse one. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> he, I was hoping we were at least to verse 2. <clears throat> he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Okay, real quick. Sorry, real quick. Again, quick note. This is what Satan does. This is what Satan does. He, he, he brings doubt. Now, doubt isn't always a bad thing, okay? We need to question things and we need to study and that but what Satan is doing here is he's turning a positive into a negative. And he says, did God really say not to eat of any tree? Well actually what God said is eat of any tree in the garden except this one. And then what Satan does is says, did he really say not to eat of every tree? Do you see how that's a little bit negative? And it's like, oh yeah, he did say that. He did say I shouldn't eat of every single tree. Instead of the positive of saying, you have free reign over the Garden of Eden. You can eat of every single tree in the garden except for one. Just one tree. And Satan flips it to a negative connotation. And that's, I mean, we hear that from our kids sometimes too, right? Or kids, you, you hear that from your parents. It's a little bit flip. We hear something, it's like, oh, that's, I'm going to take that in the negative. It makes us not want to follow. All right. That might be a little bit done for a little while, but maybe not. I might stop again. Verse 2. <laughs> Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it. She added that one in there. God didn't say don't touch it. He said don't eat of it. Lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, that was what Satan wanted to begin with. That's what he wanted for himself. He wanted to be like God. And so now he's trying to manipulate someone else to try to be, hey, we can do this together. Let's be like God. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Okay, we've got through seven verses so far. I got to stop again, just real quick. The way that she's tempted. I want to bring just a, a quick note, and you guys can study this a little bit later on if you want to write down Luke 4, 3 through 13. The way that she is tempted is the exact same way that Jesus is tempted by Satan when he's done fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus fasts, and then he, he has this... Um, uh, this confrontation with Satan. So the exact same way in that she saw that it was good to eat. She saw that it was good to eat, so she had lust of the eyes. She saw something that she wanted. It was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to, to be desired to make one wise. Lust of the flesh. She wanted to be why? She wanted to be smart. And Satan says the exact same thing to Jesus in the temptation of Christ. You can look it up, and I encourage you guys to do that. And then the third one, and that was uh, she took of its fruit and ate. 
And she gave some to her husband. Greed. She had greed. And Jesus is confronted with that same temptation. The difference is that Jesus lived an incredibly perfect life and died for us to cover for the mistakes of Adam and Eve. And then us. All right. And they heard the sound of the Lord, verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? This is just like dad to kids talk, right? God knows. He knows that like when your kids do something and you already know, you're just trying to get them to say it. Kids, I'm telling you, that's what's going on. We already know, so you might as well just fess up, right? <clears throat> Verse 12. The man said, this is, this is brilliant, guys. The man said, the woman whom you gave me, classic dude, who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit, of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, he's saying this to, yeah, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And here he's talking to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, you shall bruise your, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. We're going to stop right there on verse 19. Because we need to dive into this a little bit more. I know we've dove into it a little bit. I want to dive in just a little bit more and say this main thing, okay? What we've learned from these first 19 verses is that sin destroys us. Sin destroys us. Sin destroys me. Sin destroys you. And the way that this works is they knew about evil, but they had never experienced it. Adam and Eve knew about evil. God told them about evil, but they had never experienced it before. Now in this moment, they've now experienced evil. They have now sinned. They have become sinful beings because of the choice that they had that God gave them last week. They decided to go down this road. And here's how they did it. Here's how Satan did it. We talked about the negative thing. He also got them to focus on what's right in front of them right now. He made, and made them make an impulse buy. You know what I mean about an impulse buy when you're at the grocery store and they have all the snacks at the end of the, like, right when you're about to check out? You're like, oh, cool, I guess I could, I could get some of the, like, some bubble gum or, or a gift card. I don't know what all they have there anymore um, at, at grocery stores. But that's an impulse buy, right? We, we make some of these, like, flippant decisions. Like, oh, yeah, that won't bother me right now. See, Satan is saying, surely you won't die right now. He's saying, surely you, you'll eat of this. You're not going to drop dead instantly. And isn't that the same way that it works with us? Oh, you know what? A little bit of this won't, won't, won't hurt me, right? Isn't there a song, Little This Can't Be Wrong? It's from the 90s? Yeah. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Sorry, I saw you. Uh, that is the mentality, right? We're like, hey, impulse buy. Let's, I, I can do this one thing. It's not going to affect me. It's not going to impact my life. It's, you know what? This decision that I make, it's only right now. I can stop at any moment of my life. I can make this stop at any time. Impulse buys. We're thinking of this short term. We only think about temporary satisfaction. But what we need to understand, especially from this story, is that temporary satisfaction has eternal consequences, 
Temporary satisfaction has eternal consequences. And you might think that that sin in your life is not impacting anyone else around you, but I got to tell you that it is. It might not seem like much right now, but I guarantee further down the line, it's going to impact you. It's going to hurt you. There's people that I know of. I mean, this week, I've encountered person after person whose decisions have ruined their lives. Something that started out small. In fact, on on Monday, I was alerted to this. There's a very well-known theologian, pastor, apologetics guy. Some of you know who this guy is. He was instrumental in a lot of people's faiths. And he, he passed away, like in, I think in March or April, something like that, maybe May. He would speak at colleges all across the country, all across the world, in debate with atheists. Brilliant, smart guy. And he even had a quote that I had written down. So I had this message written several weeks ago. And I had this quote from him. And it applied so well to this. And it said, sin will always take you further than you want to go. Will cost you more than you want to pay. And will keep you longer than you want to stay. And on Monday... His board confirmed a bunch of sexual allegations against him. So when I read that quote, he was telling the truth. Sin always takes you further than you want to go and costs you more than you have to pay. And he destroyed lives. His legacy is now gone. And he's hurt hundreds and hundreds of people in the process. And I'm sure it didn't start out that way. I'm sure it didn't start with sexual abuse. It probably started with something small and insignificant. Like, ah, that was, I I shouldn't do that again. But then shame wells up, and that's something that made you feel better, and so now you got to go and do it again. Maybe it started with porn. Maybe it started with something else. I don't know. I, I don't know the guy. I didn't talk to him. I never met him. I just know about what happened. Another guy this week, I was was walking along in Christ. He's an addict. And he just decided to start using just a little bit. Just a little bit at first. Just a little bit. He can get by. It's okay. And then a little bit further on. Okay, I need a little bit more. Now I need a little bit more of this. Now I need to, you know what? I'm going to start drinking again. I'm going to start, there's a few more drugs that I need to get. And it just escalates and it escalates. It escalates quickly. Until I met with him on Thursday night. And he's strung out of his mind. Hiding behind a trash can because he thinks the cops are after him. He'd been there for an hour. I bring him home and he's like, I need help. His relationships were gone. Had nobody else. He's completely alone. So anytime we think that this impulse by, whatever it is that we're going through in our lives are just... They're only going to affect me. They're only going to impact me. They're never going to impact you, just you. There's a whole lot of people that it's going to impact. So if there's sin in our lives, we need to take care of it because sin always leads to death and destruction. Sin always destroys. If there's something that I know for sure, it's that sin always destroys. And what I think that we've, we've come across as a church is saying like, okay, well, there's certain sins that we're going to make sure that we talk about a lot. And there's certain sins that we're not going to talk about at all. That way we can make ourselves feel good and make everybody else feel bad. And what I want to say is that sin destroys us, whoever we are, whatever sin you have in your life. Now we can look at this, this pastor and be like, oh man, yeah, that was really bad. Glad I'm not like him. 
Or we can look at this addict and say, oh man, that's, that's pretty brutal. I'm glad I'm not like him. I'm glad I don't have those issues. But we would miss the entire point that sin affects every single one of us. It impacts every single person in this room. And until we get serious about sin and deal with sin on a personal level, it's going to keep eating away at us and it's going to destroy us. And it feels right in the moment. It might feel good in the moment. But there are consequences for our sin. Sin always leads to death. Romans says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin destroys us. We need to look at ourselves. We need to look at our own lives. I need to look at my own life and see where sin is impacting my life. See, verse 15, we'll go back to this a few times today. Verse 15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now what this means is enmity, I had to look that word up because I, you know how there's some of those words where you're like, I think I know what this means, but you're not, you, somebody was like, hey, what does enmity mean? And you're like, you know. You just, you just kind of, you, you feel what it is, but you don't really know what it is. Uh, that was me. And so I had to look it up. Um, enmity basically means that we are actively opposed to one another. That you are actively opposed or you're against, you're hostile towards one another. And so if he's talking about snakes, then good, yeah. Because I don't like snakes. <laughs> I have enmity with snakes. We don't like each other. We have an understanding that snakes don't come into my house and I won't come into the backyard, ever. But he's not just talking about snakes. That would be silly if it was just about snakes. No, he's talking about Satan. There's enmity between Satan and us. That's why we feel guilty. There's enmity between us and sin. It might feel good for a moment, but it always leads to guilt. It always leads to to shame of some kind. And we might block it out for a while and block it out and block it out and block it out. But at the end of the day, when we close our eyes at night and we lay our heads down and there's that little unsettling. It's like, man, I really screwed it up today. In those quiet moments, we still hear the Holy Spirit speaking. And the more we go on, the quieter the Holy Spirit gets. The more we continue to reject, the quieter He becomes in our lives. And it escalates quickly, and before we know it, we've paid a penalty, and we can't afford it. Thankfully, though, that's not where this story ends. There's a few more verses to read, thankfully. Whew, okay, enough Baptist guilt. Let's keep going. Okay? Verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim, which is a form of angel, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Here's why those four verses are important to us. God gives grace and mercy. God gives grace and mercy. Oh, good. I'm so glad there's a second half to this message. You know, like, second half? What? (laughs) I'm so glad there's a second part to this message. God gives mercy and grace. And we can see it here to Adam and Eve. 
He gives them mercy by making them clothing. See, before they had sinned, they had no idea that they should be ashamed of their nakedness. They had nothing to be ashamed of. And then God, once they sin, they realize that they're naked before God. This is more of like a, an idea, like a, um, I don't know the word I'm looking for. This is, this is something where they see, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anybody? No, nothing. Okay, great. They, they, they are aware of their nakedness before God. Their shame is there. Their guilt is there. Before there was none, and now there is shame. So he made them clothing. They attempted to with some leaves. Anybody ever try to dress with leaves? Don't. Don't even try. This summer, I don't want to go to the jail to, when, when you're, you've gotten arrested for indecent exposure. It's probably itchy, I would imagine. Too much. Okay. To Adam and Eve, he showed mercy by making them clothing. Just a simple act of showing mercy. Mercy means withholding punishment. Sure, there is punishment there, but it could have been so much more severe. He shows mercy and he shows grace by making them clothing. Which is nice. And he shows mercy and grace by removing them from the tree of life. See, if they had been able to stick around with the tree of life, guess what? They would have been separated from God forever. The tree of life is bringing eternal life. Okay, The tree of life was there so that they could live for eternity. Did you know that death was never a part of the plan from the beginning? That's why death is so hard for us to understand. And, and, and we can never grasp it. We can never accept it. Even when there's a person who's 120 years old and they finally pass away, it's like, oh, we're still sad about that and somewhat surprised. It's like they were, they were 120 years old. We shouldn't be surprised. But the reason that death always impacts us, always hurts us, is because it's not natural. Death was introduced after the fall. And so we have this impact. And so what happened is God removed them from the tree of life. That was showing mercy and grace. Otherwise, they would have lived forever on the earth, eternally separated from God. He showed mercy by removing the tree of life. And sometimes in our lives, God shows mercy to us by removing things from our lives. We may think it's a bad thing at the time, but know that God is for us. God works everything out for his good. And it is also for our good. There's a verse for that. You can look it up. God works everything together for his purpose. And so if he needs to remove something from our lives, he will do it. Sometimes when we're stuck in sin, it's like driving down the road and hearing that something is wrong with your car. And instead of just continuing to drive and trying to fix it while you drive. You've got to pull over, pop the hood, and figure out what's wrong. Sometimes we just need to stop, and God makes us stop. Like I said last week, that day of rest is good for a few different things. But sometimes we need to stop, pop open the hood, and see what's really going on to us, for us to get to the, the issues. God shows us mercy and grace. He showed it to Adam and Eve, and he shows it to us. He clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. That is grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Giving us something that we did not deserve. That's grace. That's grace. When he sent Christ down to live a perfect life on the cross and, and die on the cross for us, he gave us grace in that. So that we can turn to him and say, I am sorry for the things that I've done in my life. Would you please forgive me? I'm going to turn away from the sin in my life. And I'm going to continually turn away from the sin in my life. Because even as Christians, when you become a Christian, it doesn't just magically all go away. We have to continually turn, continually repent. Now, it doesn't mean that we're at risk of losing our salvation. I'm just saying that we need to continually be repentant towards an all-loving, all-knowing God. 2 Corinthians 5.21. I want to just read this verse to you real quick. Talking about Jesus. For our sake, he made him to be sin. Talking about Jesus. He made him to be sin. He didn't make him to be a sinner. That's important. 
He didn't make him to be a sinner. He made him to be sin. Jesus had never sinned a day in his life. Who knew no sin. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. We might be in good standing with God because of the penalty that Jesus paid for us. He became sin who knew no sin. The great exchange, and that gives us grace. So he clothes us in the righteousness of Christ, just like he clothed Adam and Eve with clothing to hide their nakedness. God clothes us in the righteousness of Christ, the justification of Christ, the love of Christ, so that we can have this relationship with him and we don't have to feel shame. There is no shame for those who belong to Christ. So he clothes us in his righteousness and at the end of the book, he brings us back to the tree of life. So in the beginning, he took Adam and Eve away from the tree of life and then at the end, we go back to the tree of life. If you want to look at this real quick for me before we close up, Revelation 2, 22, I'm sorry. Revelation 22, at the end of your book. So we've got the first three chapters of Genesis, and then we've got the finality of it, and the last chapter, last few chapters, last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22. Starting in verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the th throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Now here's where I want to read for you guys. Also, on either side of the river... The tree of life makes an appearance with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. So we get to be back to the tree of life. God gave us grace. God shows us mercy. So that one day we get to go back and see that tree. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a little bit excited to see it. It's probably like the one in um, Lion King, you know, the really big one. Something like that. I'm pretty sure that's, you can read it later and that's a small group thing. So our God attribute is this today, that God is love. God is love. In that, he showed us mercy and he showed us grace. So what I want to ask you guys is, are you impulse shopping or are you long-term planning? Are you just doing whatever feels good and looks good and makes you happy? Or do we have a plan are we trusting in this book? Are we trusting in what God has for us? Are we trusting in the love of God? And maybe for some of us, we started going the wrong way. Maybe for some of us, we're letting some of that sin creep up into our lives. We're seeing some of this stuff start happening and it's perpetuating and maybe we're starting to lose a little bit of a grip on it. We're starting to lose the handle on sin a little bit. It's starting to direct our lives. For you, there's still hope, there's still love. Because as long as there is breath in our lungs, God is here and he is ready for forgiveness. It doesn't matter how far away you go, the love of Christ never changes. To my friend in the attic, to, the attic who is uh, hiding from the cops behind, the, behind a dumpster, the love of Christ is as real in that moment to him as it is for us sitting here right now. That is the exact same love of Christ. Just because one person can pretend to have their life figured out, another person can't seem to get ahead. The love of Christ never changes. And for you and for me, that's really great news. We're going to sing one more song, obviously, because the band is here. 
the name of the song is God is Love. And we've sung it once or twice here. Um, some of it's a little bit difficult to sing, but the bridge, the, the, towards the end of the song, just says that I know my God is love. I know my God is love. So I'm going to ask you guys to sing that out. Once it gets to that part, I, I know it, it's going to take you a minute to figure it out, but close your eyes. It's simple to sing. Maybe for you, like I said, maybe you have never experienced that love before. Maybe church has hurt you in the past and said your sin is the worst sin and we can't have you here. Maybe that's been a bad experience for you and, and I just want to invite you to open yourself up to the love of Christ this morning. Clothe yourself in His righteousness. And His mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the love that you have for us. Thank you that you are good. God, you are just. You continue to give us grace and mercy. God, I pray that for anyone here that is struggling with some type of sin, God, I pray that they would open up to you and, and maybe to a, a trusted friend. God, I pray for those here that maybe have never experienced your love before. God, that today would be the day that they experience your love. Thank you for all you've done for us. We love you. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.